<laughs> I was, I was said, well, you work on memorialization. So, so thank you for bringing him here by proxy. <laughs> First of all, I wanted to just give you an opportunity to ask questions about our papers. If you had any questions, go ahead. No, thank you all for presenting today. These presentations were truly amazing. Um, I think something that they all had in common was trying to think through very seriously the question of how we relate to history and what it means to think about the archive and how we can relate to them in the modern day. Uh, I suppose my question is, what do all the panelists think are the kind of imperatives of our contemporary situation, both in terms of coalition building, but in terms of understanding this deep, rich history and what we have to learn from it? I suppose I can <laughs> take a stab at that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's a great, uh, thank you for that question. I yeah. think the, uh, it's a, uh, it strikes to the heart of, uh, in the, the work I presented, you know, it's, it's archival work, you know, and it's, 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 but it's not drawing from a single archive. It's, in a sense, archive creation, in a way. And that also, and that in particular demands uh, a, a serious consideration of what ethical implications this archive uh, holds for the communities that, on the one hand, memorializes, and for what kind of futures it helps to uh, um, make visible, audible, and sort of sensible in the present moment. And I think uh, about what the present, how the present, as you put it, how the present circumstances inform the creation rather than the sort of salvage or discovery, I suppose, uh, of archival materials. Um, uh, and at the same time, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's never a complete archive either. Uh, it's always incomplete, and thinking about how to deal with that state of incompletion uh, as an ongoing condition of sort of academic engagement, I think helps to avoid the, again, that sort of, that um, uh, mentality of discovery or that something that seeks to sort of make whole and completely known what is always essentially uh, unknowable in its entirety. So thinking about that sort of incompletion of uh, experiences as, as, as one can sort of access it at various points uh, through various sounds, through various small gestures, um, and, and, and trying to attend to what the significance of what, what is on the surface of recorded sound or what is on the surface of, uh, of textual media, uh, what that uh, um, means, I think, most centrally in the present moment. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would, if I, yeah, I, mean, I would say that, I would say two things. One is there's more stuff than we think. We often go by the default that these things are not available. These things are lost. Um, but I think there's more stuff. We just need to know how to find them, right? Um, the other thing, this stems from a project that I'm, I'm doing uh, with my students at University of Maryland. Um, on the history of community archives. And one thing that we're, we're discovering, and this is also new to me, that we're reading a lot of articles from the 70s and 80s. They were having the same questions and they're offering the same responses that we are now. So I think one thing that we need to do, like to, in terms of what we need to study, is actually what was happening to these efforts in the 70s and 80s, because we have largely ignored them. We have forgotten that these people were fighting for things, right? Um, and I mean, we have John and Francis here, uh, you know, and we, we need to make sure their legacy is uh, keeps going, and and all, but not just their legacy keeps going, but we need to understand what they were working with, right? And and some of the solutions, a lot of the solutions that we we think a lot of our solutions are are new, but they're not, right? So I think studying these past. Uh, work, act activist work, I think is, is important here. I want to comment on the coalitional possibilities because uh, my current work is really looking at rainbow coalitions uh, through music, so to speak. I sp 
specifically focus on Afro-Asian, but my paper is really an uh, important historical background to show that African-American music has always had some influence on Japanese Americans. Um, and in the camps, it had a very uh, therapeutic one, but it was still being recognized as an art form that stamped their American identity. You know? And I just want more his kind of historical background for us to share between different demographic groups to show that we do have common struggles and do have common intersections in, in the past that I think could lend itself for some coalitional possibilities, because I'm very concerned about the con divide and conquer mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, notion that's happening again, well, has, continues, I should say. And particularly between Afro-Asian, just because I'm concerned about the anti-Asian um, assaults, and many of the perpetrators have been African American. I'm concerned about that. And I want to find ways to bring together groups. Um, and one, I placed a responsibility on myself. I became a member of the NAACP, and I'm active in Boston. We have a big conference, annual conference, coming up in Boston in July. And I'm, trying, I'm going to try and liaise with Asian American groups in Boston to see if we can create some collaboration. So that's really at the bottom of my paper, <laughs> even though it's not obvious, <laughs> um, is this coalition, the coalitional possibilities. I'm, I think we ethnomusicologists need to think about those kinds of, of efforts and what role we can play in them. <coughs> Uh, this question is to Professor Asai. Um, you cited the importance of uh, cultural activities as an act of resistance uh, of their incarceration. And so can you share sort of the fun aspects of, of that? Like say, for example, where does the Manzanar, why the big band jazz call themselves the Manzanar Jai Bombers? And then also that they perform a standard called Don't Fence, Fence Me In. in. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> which they love to play with their horns directed to the guard tower. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was their fun, fun form of resistance, um, but it actually sincere. <laughs> and the Manzanar Jive Bombers? Yeah, the Jive Bombers, yes. Um, well, uh, I don't know what the, you know, who thought of that that particular term. But it, had to do with, it had to do with the uh, suicide. Oh, this, okay. Yeah, see, that's, see, okay. that's the paradox. Or, yeah, uh, all right. Just like, I mean, Eric, we just talking about peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, I just thought they were mentally thinking of bombing <laughs> <laughs> their guards and, and their circumstances. But that makes sense, yeah. Asians. 
So I'm someone, I'm African, who grew up here as an immigrant in Jordan, and to have seen the last few years, what has conspired. During the lockdown, for example, you have um, Chinese people really nasty to people from a that came to my tribe in China. We saw that already too. Then I'm someone that hung out. I used to say some of my best friends for 20 years were Chinese. So I've been to Chinese funerals, I've been to New Year's every year, you know, and to see those people retaliate against me. And also, we have to be mindful that you are in America. There's race. People that look like me experience it every single day. And to see that the media, the racist, the racist media, I'm often the media photographer, <laughs> to see that what you see in the news is when an African American homeless person, for example, commits a crime against an agent. What about all the times when I've been volunteering in Flatbush and I see Asian women, older Asian women, fighting people that's from Haiti and no one covers it? So what I'm trying to say is that we are all here as immigrants, for the most part. We all have this struggle. Let's be mindful of that people that look like me go through a lot that you don't see in the media. So we should be careful when we say, because media shows it doesn't mean that it's always true. So let's be mindful of that. Yes. Thank you. Enjoyed it, uh, the presentation. The uh, as I was looking at it, uh, I'll, I'll make this comment. Then I have my question. I'll give you a preview of my question. My question is, how do you feel about how this is taught in the high school and elementary level? I'll circle back to that. But um, I just wanted to say that I have ne had never really thought about it before. But as I was uh, watching your presentations, I realized that this issue about um, the culture within the camps. Uh, suggests to me that there was a feeling of hope that, oh, someday this war is going to be over. Someday we're going to uh, be able to take our place as Americans again. And then I, I also thought about the camps themselves, the conditions, um, and so this is clearly not the Jewish Holocaust. This is clearly not like terrible concentration camps where they're trying to commit genocide. So. I, on the American side, it, 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 it's a certain, a certain uncertainty, a, a certain idea of, okay, well, we, we're not sure about these folks. We're going to, because of racist uh, beliefs we have, we're going to intern these folks. But uh, we're not going to treat them too badly because, uh, and, and of course, there are exceptions to this. Uh, but, you know, we think that this war is also going to end someday. And, uh, these people are going to be uh, considered Americans again for the most part. So there is, there is this feeling of hope on both sides. Now, uh, and coming back to right now, we have a situation where every single school board is a battleground in America uh, and specifically about history. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, if they want to do a battle about whether the Civil War was about slavery, for example, then they definitely would, uh, uh, those same people who, uh, who don't want slavery to be exposed in, in the public schools would definitely have some feelings about the idea of uh, the Japanese internment. So I won't, uh, uh, that's why I'm asking a question about how do you folks feel about the teaching of your subject matter at the high school and uh, elementary school level? Maybe it depends on um, where you live, what state you're in. <laughs> um, but I think um, I was just thinking maybe larger themes uh, to talk about music and trauma, and then just cover different historical events or populations. That's a very good question because I don't think we're teaching um, enough of the histories. And this is what's perpetuating uh, the kind of uh, 
singular vision of what America is, unfortunately. Um, and I don't know what the solution is, um, but I've always felt that ethnomusicologists, even though we're kind of involved with our own research, we probably should be creating more materials. I don't know. Um, I know there's a music education section. I, I haven't been on it. I'd be interested to know what they think. Um, but I think the creation of materials is important, so that gets back to the archive and, and having places where people have access to materials. But uh, curricular plans um, and just uh, papers and research maybe geared more towards that level. But, and that's a challenge, I think. That's a big challenge. Not to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but could Eric maybe say something? Yeah, about please. Something Eric, you're, you're, you're the, <laughs> this is your specialty. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I might have a slightly darker view of this. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. Education is important. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not trying to denigrate that. But education is not going to solve racism. Mm -hmm. I mean, at a certain level, it's going to be about belief. And education, I'm not sure is about belief. At least we're not willing to go there. Because I think we still have a mind-body problem in education, that, that we're, we are focusing, you know, curriculum issues. I think we're thinking of mind issues and not really belief issues, like rational issues rather than belief issues. And when it comes down to it, it's ultimately about belief, right? If you don't believe that another person is fully human, I don't know what type of education is going to solve that problem. So. I'm not suggesting that education is not necessary. And I, I think it is absolutely necessary. And I work a lot in education, right? And, and um, Deborah was part of the committee that hired me to do this Smithsonian uh, pathway. Um, but yeah, so, so we, we, we are, we're, we're creating uh, resources so that uh, at Smithsonian Folkways on many different topics at diff many different grade levels, from like, I think the lowest one is, is there a kindergarten one? I, I, I know there's like a third or fifth grade one. Um, but I'm working on a high school uh, curriculum for uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander music. Um, and there theoretically is, is 12 lessons, uh, but if you really want to go through everything, it's gonna take you many months. Uh, so each, I, I, I don't think you know, it will be a situation where uh, a teacher would go straight through everything in a single lesson, but I think they will pick and choose. And the idea is that um, a, uh, a music teacher, a social studies teacher, and a language arts teacher can use the lesson at the same time. So there are three sections to each lesson. Uh, and the idea is that, so, I mean, that, that's a general framework of, of, the, of the learning path is that multiple teachers can get together and teach the same topic. Um, but, I mean, different skills, but the same topic, right? So I think, I think this, is, this is a really, uh, you know, I think this helps to really break down some of the disciplinary walls that we have around our education system. Um, yeah. And uh, I would go ahead and add that, I suppose, on, on with a, with, a, with a twinge of optimism, I suppose, although your point is very well taken, I think, you know, but given the work that you're doing, I think it's, you know, <laughs> uh, important to at least uh, express my enthusiasm for that, for that. Uh, <laughs> um, but I'll, I would also add that in terms of how this material is or could be taught, I would say, compared to my own experience, uh, I grew up in the Bay Area in California, went through California public schools uh, that were by and large, 50-50 Asian American and white, and I learned absolute zero about Japanese American uh, incarceration uh, from K to eighth grade. So, uh, and that was in you know the 90s. <laughs> so, so uh, anything could you know anything is better than nothing. Right? Yeah. So. Um, 
I, I, I think it's hard to disagree with that because so much of education is about um, credential, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't have to be. I, I do actually have a request for the room uh, because there's not that many of us here. Could you say your name, you know, um, as you, like, what is your name, for instance? Uh, my name is Jordan C. Daly. Jordan, good to meet you. And yours? Jenny, Jenny Chung. Jenny Chung, cool. Yeah, I mean, it just deepen the conversation, right? If we begin to get to know each other. Um, I'm Deborah Wong, I'll be speaking later today. Um, and I loved the, you know, oh my God, screen full of questions that flashed up for a minute. They were all great questions. They're long gone. But, um, <laughs> 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 there they are. yeah, they're, they're amazing questions which really brought home the excellence of this panel. So thank you to all three of you for, you know, for making the connections, you know, even clearer. Yeah. So I mean, at, at, at I'll just pick up on one of them. You know, Eric, your, your questions about how some of these recent albums seem more focused on empathy, you know, and feeling, and you know, that kind of potential for connection across something, difference. Um, yeah, I mean, I actually would like to know what you think about all of that, because rather than just ask us what we think about it, because, um, you know, all of this comes up like at this moment when finally after you know, May of 2020, suddenly systemic racism becomes, you know, a broad spread phrase and understanding and concept, right? So are, are you seeing this as kind of a, you know, a binary, you know, a, a fallback position to, you know, feeling full connection as opposed to structural issues? I'm wondering where you come down on this. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't have a final answer to, to your question. Uh, I also note that both of these albums are really worked on in the late 2010s, right? So this is pre-George Floyd music, right? Uh, uh, Kishibashi's album came in 2019. Um, Nono Boy's album, what, 21, but recorded earlier. Yeah, so uh, so I, I don't know. I haven't talked to them about what they think now uh, about, about these things. Um, I think the move to affect is important. I mean, there there is, um, I mean, there's a lot of literature in museum studies and, and things like public history about the importance of grabbing people through relevance and um, grabbing people through relevance and affect. And, and, and affect can get people to do things, right? If you if you feel something, people might do something because of it, right? So it can lead to, it can lead to action. Right? Um, the, the question is how do you translate the affect to um, social things, right? So not just people listening by themselves and then Googling about these, these things, but how do you actually get people together after people listen to this music? and actually happen to do something as a group. I don't know how to do that, right? But, but I, think, I think the move to affect is important. I, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm sort of flippant when I talk about the Kishibashi song, because that song sort of drives me up the wall, <laughs> uh, because it's so upbeat, right? <laughs> it's so relentlessly happy. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I I I think trying to get at these other ways of getting to people, I think is important to to incorporate into our into our toolbox. Does that does that help? Well, thank you, panel.